Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Keeping It Simple. Today's guest is Brent Johnson, founder and CEO of Santiago Capital and host of Milkshakes, Markets, and Madness, which can be found on YouTube or any major podcast network. As a reminder, today's episode is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it is not intended to be considered investment advice. And now over to you, Harley and Mike. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming to join us, Brent. I think you're familiar with this soundtrack. Where's our techie? I can't hear, but I have a feeling which I know oh, I know what you're can playing. Can you hear that? Yeah. Oh, I know. That's terrible. Okay. So I was playing my milkshake, right? So what you're known as is the dollar milkshake man. You're th- theory around the US dollar sitting at kind of the center of the universe and basically creating conditions when stress emerges, where money has to get sucked back into the United States, bears a lot of resemblance to the world that I think you and I kind of grew up inhabiting where that same narrative existed around Japan, right? Things would turn bad, Japan became the safety bid, the yen became the safety bid, money would flow back in. And part of what you You've been arguing for a couple of years now is, is that that relationship has actually started to switch, that increasingly the focus there is the U.S. dollar. Is is, is that a fair characterization of where, where you would put things? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And, and in many ways, you know, the whole dollar milkshake theory and the reason I've pounded the table on it as hard as I have is really just my attempt to kind of educate people how the system actually works, the way it's designed and also to push back on the evergreen, everlasting, the dollar is gonna die tomorrow uh, themes that just never seem to go away. And the the, the interesting thing for me is that I'm actually extremely sympathetic to the idea that the dollar is a crappy currency and loses its purchasing power over time, et cetera, et cetera. But I I think many people kind of get caught in that dogma and as a result, end up hurting themselves rather than helping themselves. And so the dollar milkshake theory has really been my attempt to help kind of see through the fog of these crazy markets that we're having and kind of bring it back to a, to a center. Perfect. So we went out before um, this podcast and surveyed on Twitter um, you know, and asked a couple of questions about this type of topic, right? One is, you know, will the dollar end up changing? Can we post those polls? polls and and hit those um, on the screen. Okay, so first question, is the Fed finished hiking? Are they going to do 25 to 50 basis points more? Are they going to do more than 50 basis points? And is there serious risk of the US dollar losing its global reserve status in the next five years? Now, Harley and I can't pick, but I know that Brent would say, Fed's probably done, and we're probably not going to have a serious crisis that results in the U.S. dollar losing its reserve currency status. Did I guess right? You know, I would actually say 25 more, and but then I would I would agree with you on number two that uh, okay. that the U.S. dollar is not going to lose the, the the status in the next five years. Harley, you, you, you oh, looks like you are in the majority, Brent. You have a thought, uh-huh. Harley? I think they're done, uh, but 25 is possible, but. You know, it's a, it's a throwaway. I mean, yeah, I kind of I, I kind of lean in that camp as well. I, I I mean, look, I've been wrong in terms of what they were, how far they were going to push this, and I certainly have to confess that I'm surprised today by the reaction from the markets. Although I think that there's a noticeable freakout component associated with the budget statement that came across today. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that, Brent. Did you uh, did you see how bad the budget statement was today, Harley? Did you get a chance? I to see it? I, I didn't see it. The number was, let me see if I have it here in front of us. We have now taken the government spending fiscal year to date, 2023, we're at $1.6 trillion versus $887 billion deficit versus last year. This has been a heck of an increase, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Um, interestingly, the some of the biggest components of that are actually tied specifically to this discussion, right? Are we going to hike up, hike interest rates? Um, Just those two components, the Federal Reserve, the the interest on excess reserves, that is an additional 
at this point, 136 billion on a year to date basis on just the month, it's actually started to climb pretty significantly. And then the other thing that is that is hitting the budget is actually the loss of the Federal Reserve earnings, right? So last year, that was almost $100 billion in profits that's now gone. And in a weird way, that's actually almost bigger than the interest expense so far. Um, the other thing that happened this month, and I'm still trying to track down total proof of this, is that we, we spent, quote unquote, something like $85 billion in the education department in a single month. And I think what that actually is, is the write-off of student loans. That's what it appears to be, the write-off of a portion of student loans that meet the income and the income requirement dynamic. So I think that's a big chunk of what's going on, um, is people are very concerned about the underlying deficit dynamics. One of the things, Harley, that you and I have chatted very briefly about is this dynamic of not having to pay your taxes in California until October. Now, Brent moved to Puerto Rico, so he doesn't have to pay taxes, or at least has to pay far fewer taxes than you and I did. But certainly as a California resident, I'm currently enjoying a nice holiday as I wait and earn 5% on my cash balances getting you know, waiting to be paid. I, I noticed the other day that Google is in the exact same situation that they're they've got nine billion dollars that they have in unpaid taxes earning five plus percent in the money market fund right now. Pretty sweet gig when you got it. It'll all come back to get you. It unfortunately will. I think it's going to be an interesting dynamic in terms of reintroducing some of the volatility. Okay, so one of the points that Brent is well known for is this idea that the U.S. dollar is not going to fall as rapidly in value or is not going to depreciate to the extent everyone thinks. And candidly, I'm a little confused because if I look at the U.S. dollar, man, all I see is stability, right? This is actually the picture of the U.S. dollar in Bloomberg. Um, Brent, do, does that match your expectation for stability? Well, when it just goes flatline for 20 years, I mean, that's about as stable as it gets, right? Uh, you know, we could call this the, the you know, the $1 equals $1 chart or the, you know, the, the fiat version of one BTC equals one BTC. Um, but I think to your point, and I think I know why you're putting this chart up here is, is, is the point that I've tried to make is that everything rotates around the right. dollar. The whole system is built around the dollar. So this is the dollar priced in the dollar. And right. we can look at a lot of other things priced in the dollar, but uh, you know, you don't have to like it, but it's just really important to understand that this is how the system is designed. And so th this is, I, I'm not sure if this is why you put it up here, but in many ways, this does represent the theory because this saying that the dollar is going to fall first and everything else is going to be okay would be kind of like saying, you're gonna remove the foundation from the house, but everything in the attic is gonna be just fine. Um, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. You can't you can't blow up the foundation and have the rest of the house be okay. And uh, you know, I, I see the dollar as the foundation of the monetary system. Yeah. Brent, I have a question for you. Uh, just sure. big concept. Um, and 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 I'm I guess with you, I I don't think the dollar's ever going any place. It's not my lifetime. Is the story here that that if the dollar the people who are against the dollar or think it's going to do poorly, is that they believe the dollar will do bad, or is it? A matter of everybody else is going to do worse. I, I mean, I, I kind of view it that um, you know the the, the the Bill Gross thing of the cleanest dirty shirt. It's it, I don't care what the U.S. does. I don't see a Plan B in any reasonable future. Um, so I don't even care well, about yeah. these stories of, of, of dollar destruction. Well, th th that's the story I've tried to tell, and and I've had a lot of people say to me, "Well, yeah, unless you're but unless you're a currency trader, this doesn't matter." And the point that I've tried to push back and say, yes, it does matter because if everything is priced in the dollar, you know, which is basically what this chart here is showing. Right. And if, if all fiat currencies fall in purchasing power, but the US dollar falls slower than everything else, it creates deflationary pressures in dollar terms, which has the potential to undermine and create chaos in the entire system. So even though you may be, even though fiat may be losing value, you can still have deflationary pressures, which is a little bit hard for people to get their head around, but but that's actually the way it is. That's, that's the design of the system.
And that's really the underlying story that I'm actually trying to hit here. I mean, one of the things that's so fascinating to me about this is, Brent, I don't know if you remember when, when I was spending a lot more time talking in the crypto space, particularly about Tether and Bitcoin, et cetera. You know, one of the things that we discovered was that many of the exchanges had hard coded the value of Tether to one, right? So it wasn't even actually trading as a metric. It was treated, you know, um, in in uh, many of the swap markets, for example, as if it was a unitary component. That's actually what's happened with the U.S. dollar. If I go into Bloomberg, people's immediate reaction to this is, well, this is just the U.S. dollar versus the U.S. dollar. Therefore, it's one. It's actually not that. It is a, it, it is actually an integral, a unit number that is programmed hardwired into Bloomberg. And everything else does indeed rotate around this number. It's it, yeah. like it's a pretty it's it's pretty incredible when you start to think about it in that way that every time we watch something move and this is one of the many reasons you see me doing ratio charts I'll price something in gold terms or whatever not because I'm necessarily saying that's the right number but simply because I'm trying to make a historical comparison between time periods when it was actually linked to gold for example there was an underlying um, exchange component to it so this is actually really important but the exactly what that brings up is the point that I think you and I would also both make, which is, well, maybe it's not really that stable at all, right? If we look at how many ounces of gold can be bought with a US dollar, it's collapsed in almost exactly the same ratios as the quantity of silver per Roman denarius. Absolutely. And, and you know, I have always said since the very first time I mentioned the word milkshake, and, you know, the funny thing is I'm probably as tired of talking about the milkshake as you are as, of talking about as passive, right? Yeah. It's like it's, you, you've, you've told the story so many times, but but I just think it's incredibly important. And the reason I think it's incredibly important is I still see pe so many people pushing back on it. Uh, but since the very first time I mentioned the milkshake, the point that I made was that, yes, the, the, the U.S. dollar is a horrible currency. And for everybody that, that, that wants to throw stones at it, I'm happy to throw the stones with you. But... This is the system as it's designed, and it's better than all of the other fiat currencies out there. And as a result, I think that we'll eventually get into a situation where the dollar and gold rise together versus everything else. And, and that was probably one of the most, I don't know, controversial pushback on points that I made, because they say that many people would say that, that can't happen. Well, you're right. The dollar can't rise versus gold in gold terms at the same time that the gold rises versus gold, but they can rise versus everything else. And, and that's really what this is about. It's about understanding. It's two components. One is understanding that dollar and gold can rise versus all the other currencies. And that if that happens, it is incredibly destabilizing for the entire system because the dollar underlies the entire system. Whether you want it to or not, whether you like it, whether you think it's a good news, it doesn't matter. That's just reality. Right. And so that, that it, it, it's imperative to understand that if the dollar and gold rise together versus all of the other, other currencies, bad things are going to happen. That, well, that is not a good war. scenario. I mean, that's nuclear war. But I mean, I mean, it's kind of yeah. that's not I don't think it happens, actually. I mean, if you look at like going back to Mike's, you know, Roman chart, I mean, roughly an ounce of gold buys, buys a fine man's suit. So you could buy a toga for an ounce of gold, you could buy a suit of armor for an ounce of gold, and you could buy a Zenya suit kind of for an ounce of gold. So gold is actually relatively stable to hard assets. So, I mean, the, the dollar and gold together is kind of like jumbo shrimp, isn't it? They, they, they don't go together. One's a hard asset well, you can grab, the well, other's kind of made up. But, but the point is, is it, it's, it's not as big a deal for U.S. investors, but if you're not a U.S. investor and you are building out your portfolio, unless you want to bet it all on one thing, in, in other words, if you want to have at least a little bit of diversification, you could buy dollars and buy gold and watch them both go up versus your home currency, because I think that's what's ultimately going to play out. Now, I've also said since the very beginning that ultimately, I think gold will win that war. You know, gold will ultimately beat the dollar. It'll beat all the other currencies, but it'll ultimately beat the dollar as well. So when people will show me these charts that Mike showed me, and it shows that you know the dollar has lost its purchasing power versus gold or silver or whatever it is, I say, yeah, that's absolutely correct, and you should own gold as a result. Um, you know, I, I've never said you shouldn't own gold. In fact, it's been quite 
quite the opposite. I, I've encouraged everybody to own gold, but well, I've well, encouraged people not to only own gold. Yeah. Well, where, where are you in the in, in Bitcoin? I hate to ask this question, but I mean, because people will say that Bitcoin is like, you know, electronic gold. Are you in that camp or you're not? I understand all the arguments, but I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm just really indifferent to, to Bitcoin. I understand all the arguments for it. I, I don't think it's as good as gold. If I had to choose between the two, I would choose gold. Gold's proven itself over 5,000 years. You know, Bitcoin's been around for almost 15. Um, so far, it hasn't proven anything other than to me that it's a speculator's paradise. But, you know, could I be wrong? I could be wrong, but I, I would choose gold over Bitcoin. I think, I think, I think, Mike, I think the interesting thing, I, I mean, I, so I actually am more sympathetic to Bitcoin, believe it or not, than I am to the gold argument. Um, I think it's very hard not to look at this type of chart and say, oh, it's a ter terrible asset. But man, if you're actually sitting in cash, right, if you decide to like wrap up in saran wrap and, and store cash in your house, then you kind of deserve this, right? Because you've chosen not yeah. to participate. You've chosen not to take any risk. You've chosen not to invest. If you put your money in, you know, T-bills um, or longer dated bonds, you actually have not had this experience at all, right? They've actually risen in gold terms over time. Um, that total return that's available to you for taking risk, participating in the system, et cetera, exceeds that of gold, except at very short periods of time, right? And this could be one of those periods of time when gold decides to really perform. But the flip side of that equation is like, I think gold works really well when you're pricing commodities. I think it's actually a phenomenal tool for pricing commodities, but I think it's a terrible tool for actually pricing our daily lives where I got to be honest with you, man, the price of, you know, corn or rough rice or pork bellies, I understand that I'm coming from a relatively privileged component, but so are all Americans, right? Food budget in total is about 13% of household expenditures versus where we were in 1900 when it was closer to 40% of household expenditures. That's just a totally, we live in a totally different world than we lived in a hundred years ago. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I would agree with that. And the other thing I would say is that I think part of the issue that I found myself getting into, and I don't know if you guys have had similar conversations, but is this, this hate of fiat, right? And, and I will say one thing about Bitcoin that I think is good is that Bitcoin has helped educate a whole new younger group of people about different types of money and different types of systems and, you know, how money loses purchasing power over time. So from that perspective, I think it's good. But I think part of the quote unquote hate of fiat is this idea um, that it always loses value and money is not supposed to do that. Right. Um, and people will say money is supposed to be a medium of exchange and a store of value. OK, nowhere in that does it say money is supposed to be a good store of value. That means you can put it under a mattress and leave it there for 100 years and it won't lose any purchasing power. It never says that when it says that gold is a store or money is a store of value. That could mean a week, it could mean a couple of days or maybe it means three months or, or, or a year. But if you to your point earlier, Mike, if you want to if you don't want to take any risk at all and you want to put your money under the mattress and just leave it there for 10 years, yeah, you're probably not going to do very well. And that's why the people that learn to invest tend to do better than the people that just stick their money under a, a mattress. Um, again, I, I don't I, I understand that people want money to be a long term store of value that they don't have to take any risk on. But unfortunately, it's a risky world. And just because you want money to be that doesn't mean money actually is that. And, and I think that's a, a key distinction to make. So Brent, Unfortunately, I would argue the same thing about gold. And, you know, Harley, to your point, the gold costs the same as a fine man's suit. Uh, what would you guess the cost of a fine man's suit is today? You know, I know you and I are not particularly in the markets for them. Whatever. Brent, what would you, I'd be just out of curiosity, I, what would you guess? Me? Oh, I know. I, I know exactly what they cost. <laughs> it depends where you want to go shopping yet, Mike. I'm, pre I'm, I'm pretty sure my mentioned... suits cost more than yours. Yeah, the, <laughs> it, you, you mentioned you mentioned Zania, right? So Zania suit is about five thousand dollars now. So mm -hmm. either gold has has gotten really really cheap, which is possible, right? Or Zania suits are reflecting the fact that they're increasingly in rarefied territory, even for the people on this call. Um, <laughs> and you don't move to Puerto Rico and need Zania suits. Um, I haven't okay. worn a suit in a long time. <laughs> 
one of the points though that I would actually raise on that, and this is exactly where we're, we're effectively we're going, which is that gold actually is kind of the anti-dollar, right? That it has maintained a negative correlation with the Dixie. It has yep. behaved in that risk off manner. Part of that's just a denominator component, right? So we're here, we're looking at US dollar versus other currencies. On the flip side of that equation, you have the gold versus the US dollar, right? So there is that underlying dynamic of we flipped the numerator and the denominator. Therefore, we get a negative correlation between these two. But do you think that that's going to continue to be the case, Brent? I mean, what you just highlighted is an idea in which both could end up rising significantly. How does that, like, well, how would you see this chart working in that way? I, I, I would expect this chart to still stay largely the same. But if you compared this chart to all the other currencies, you would see these two lines going back and forth, but rising dramatically against the other two, I think is how I would characterize that, if that makes sense. Got it. Got it. Um, now, one of the other things that I think that jumps out at me as we have these types of discussions is this dynamic of inflation. And, and I would point out if I look at uh, by the way, if anyone wants to ask a question, feel free to jump into the Q&A. Um, we are definitely interested in fielding questions from people. But so if I think about the inflation component, right, we often think about the idea that the dollar is responsible for inflation, that the dollar is causing the inflation that we see. When I look at a country like Japan, for example, right, their currency has fallen roughly 50% over the course of the past decade. And yet they've not been able to build or sustain any meaningful inflation. Well, why do you think that we don't see this direct relationship between, quote unquote, the dollar or the value of Japanese yen and, quote unquote, inflation? Well, I think a lot of it has to do is that it's a very globalized world now, right? If, 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 if China, I'm sorry, if Japan just was you know landlocked and nothing could get in or nothing could get out and its currency was falling out then i think there would be more inflation but i think because we've been in a largely deflationary world for the last 15 years or 20 years however you want to measure that um that has allowed for lack of a better way of saying it for the bank of japan to do what they've done and get away with you know the extreme monetary policy without causing the enormous inflation in, in yen terms. Wait, isn't Japan the definition of a landlocked country? I mean, they're xenophobic like crazy. No one goes there. They have a declining population, and most of the debt is owned internally. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's what's going on there. Well, well, well wait yeah. a second, though. If you if the value of your currency falls by 50%, right? Why wouldn't you see 50% or 100 percent price increase? Well, in gold, you did. <laughs> But I, it, yeah. it depends upon how much of, 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 the, of their consumption is internal consumption. I mean, for God's sake, the U.S. consumption is is mostly internally U.S., despite the uh, negative trade balance. Harley, you walked right into my trap. That's exactly what I wanted to highlight, which is that the vast majority, I actually take the opposite side of where Brent is on this. I, I think the globalization matters far less than we actually think, right? It has absolutely contributed to falling prices of goods and some forms of services, but the simple reality is, is that the vast majority of what we consume in the United States, in Japan, in China, is always produced and generated domestically. And so the currency actually, in a weird way, doesn't matter under that framework, right? Like what we really actually care about is how much demand is being pushed through. And this is exactly what we saw in 20 and 20 in 21 and 22 how much demand for the limited resources is being pushed by government spending or by availability of credit. Those things can actually change the underlying demand story in a pretty se severe way. But that then leads us to the next stage in the process, which is well, what happens when that music stops? Well, so for Japan, are you still talking about Japan or are you just talking about I, I, I'm talking more broadly now, but you know, if I'm thinking about Japan, right? I mean, Japan has a really interesting situation in which their population pressures are largely negative. All else being equal, that means there's gonna be less demand for housing, less demand for washing machines, less demand for cars going forward. I actually think weirdly, if I look at a place like Japan or China, they need that globalization desperately in order to continue to employ their citizens because their domestic, you know, the reason they're running trade surplus 
is because their domestic economies can't absorb all their capacity. I actually think it'd be the opposite of what Brent is saying. I think, it'd be, I think you'd find it to be hugely deflationary in some of these exporting countries, net exporter countries. Well, if, if Japan, if what you were to say were to happen and all of the yen outside of Japan were to stay outside and, or if all the carry trades would stay where they're at, I would probably agree with you. But if those carry trades began to unwind and all of the yen came flooding back into, into Japan, then I think you would no longer, I, then I think the, the, the loss of purchasing power of the, of the yen would be much more realized. Interesting. I'm not sure. All these, so, things, all these things are all relative to where you're standing. It's like you're looking yes, at- Yes, absolutely. Remember, remember absolutely. like, you know, high school math when you learned about base eight or base 10? Yep. I mean, all these things are, are, are where you're standing. Currency trading is, if you actually get into currency trading, it's almost mind boggling to figure out how to do a trade when you're in the US versus in Japan versus in Europe and looking other ways. Like in a currency trade, the, the, the negative convexity of a local currency trade is monumental because the gain is limited to what you invest, either other currency goes to zero, the loss is infinite. Um, it, it's, it's not up and down. And, and when you do currency option trades or other trades like that, um, it's very interesting where, where at some point a currency goes up enough in your favor, it actually goes technically against you because the denominator right. changes. Um, these are really kind of crazy issues when you actually understand how these things work. And, and so the, all this conversation about Japan versus China versus the US, it's all where you're standing. Um, there, there is no solid ground to make these statements on, um, except for in the U.S. Where, and also, where if you print money, then you get inflation. I'm a Chicago guy. Mike's trying to be a pen guy. It's not working. But I mean, we've had massive inflation in this country from the massive money printing. It just wasn't in CPI. It was in assets. It was in land and gold and stocks and bonds. That all exploded higher. Um, so it just depends what, what you're looking at. If you're looking at CPI as your inflation measure, yeah, we didn't have it, but we had it elsewhere. So th these things are very difficult to kind of pin down. So par part of what Harley is actually highlighting, I actually am going to uh, sh uh, switch to a different screen here for a second. This one is not approved by compliance, but it is the <laughs> Japanese. It is an option on Be the careful. Japanese yen oh, poor for Olga. a very long period of time. So hopefully you guys can actually see this um, green line here, right? This is Looking at a five-year call option on the yen, if the yen goes from its current level about 145 to 250 or 500 or 5,000, I actually, right? And so this is exactly Harley's point is, is that it's actually a negatively convex trade. If you're so right, the yen that you're ultimately getting paid back that trade in becomes worthless and you're not making any more money as it moves beyond a certain point, right? On the flip side of that equation, if you do the opposite trade, you could very easily find yourself so deeply underwater that like the game is basically over, right? So uh, this is actually one of the reasons why I think loss. That... It's an infinite loss. It's not underwater. It's like beyond comprehension how much you could lose. I mean, pe I mean, people never price these options right or currencies because they're not capturing the convexity of them. Again, I completely agree with you. This is why when somebody goes after a mortgage in a foreign country, right? So you saw the Hungarians, for example, getting mm -hmm. hammered with Swiss mortgages. Yep. You know, the, all those types of dynamics play out and create real conditions. The irony is, is that we don't like to use those terms, but if Hungarians enter into mortgages in Swiss franc, what they've actually entered into are reparation payments, you know, where they've agreed that they're going to make whole a foreign party um, in their own currency, right? You can't do that. It's a terrible, it's a terrible trade that is inevitably going to blow up. But one of the things that is actually really interesting, and this goes back to the milkshake dynamic, is, is that all around the world, we have dollar-denominated debt. And well, that's what I was just going to say. Right. That's exactly the point. Brent, why don't you expand on that? Yeah. Okay. So what you just described, the when the Hungarians took out a number of mortgages in Swiss francs, and then when the Swiss francs, despite their better judgment in Hungary, the Swiss francs appreciated versus the, Hung is it the Florent? Is it the Hungarian yeah, Florent, Hungarian I think? Florent. Yeah. Now those those mortgages became much, much more hard, if not impossible to pay back, right? That is, that is basically a microcosm of the dollar milkshake. That is the point that I've tried to make is everybody knows that the US owes $30 trillion. But what most of them don't know is that Entities outside the United States, 
owe more than $30 trillion in dollars. And if the dollar doesn't weaken like everybody thinks it's going to, but instead rises, that becomes increasingly hard to pay off. And when the dollar sits at the center of the monetary system and everything rotates around it, as we showed on the screen earlier, right? Um, last year, what you saw last year was basically a preview of what I think could happen. Last year was the trailer for the bigger movie. Because what you had last year was countries around the world were experiencing high levels of inflation in their local currency terms, while they were experiencing deflationary pressures in US dollar terms. And that is why the PBOC had to you know, keep easy monetary policy to um, challenge their deflationary pressures in their real estate market. And we see that flaring up again now with uh, what's it called? Country mortgage or countrywide uh, yeah. so country, gar country garden, I think is what country it's called. Garden. Yep. Country garden um, we'll in China right wide. now. Just yeah. Country wide. That, that was, that was 2008, right? Yeah. Um, and then it's why the bank of England had to intervene in the gilt market. It's why the first time that the European central bank raised rates in 10 years on the exact same day, they had to set up a new facility to buy Italian BTPs because those yields were blowing out. And it's the same reason that the Bank of Japan had to intervene not only in their yen market, but also in the JGB market because the dollar was just crushing them. And, and, and that, that is unfortunately what I think is going to play out in bigger numbers. Now, I thought it would have already played out in a bigger form than it already has. And it, it might take another five or 10 years for this to fully, fully play out. But that is the point that I've tried to make is why the dollar will fall last, because no other currency, no other fiat currency has that same dynamic, at least not to the same extent that the dollar does. And the other thing I would say is think about all of the if you're not familiar with Mike's work on passive, then you should definitely go look that up. But think of all of the passive indexes and all of those passive indexes have that dollar, that solid dollar line sitting underneath them, right? And then you think of all the quant trading that goes on now. That's not even a person making the decision, right? A lot of those are run over data feeds that whether it's Reuters or whether it's Bloomberg or whatever it is, but they have that same line underneath it, right? That that dollar line under it. And when that dollar spikes, those positions get sold. And when those positions get sold, you get massive deflation, at least in dollar terms, right? And so, you know, and then how do the governments respond? They come in and they print more money. The Bank of Japan prints more, the ECB prints more, the Turkish Central Bank print, they all print more. And so their currencies continue to fall. So I think that is kind of a bigger version of the Hungary versus Swiss franc, uh, you know, taking out a mortgage and not being able to pay it. Yeah. Does this mean it, you it like buy, the, go ahead. Does this go mean ahead, you Harley, like buying oil? Because oil is a commodity kind of like gold and it's priced and based in dollars. So a foreign country that wants to buy oil, you basically have the gold and the currency going up against you. I mean, if we get gold and dollars going up at the same time, which shouldn't happen, but if it did, that is the that, that, that that's not good. Well, so, okay, so think of it like this. Stop thinking of yourself as an American. Pretend you live in Brazil or Argentina or wherever it is. And, and the dollar is not your base currency. Yep. And your base currency is something else. And the dollar's rising versus your base currency. Gold is rising versus your base currency. Now pretend oil also starts to rise versus the dollar and it rises double versus your home currency. That's about the worst case scenario. Yep, right? that's, that's what you're talking about here. And that, that's a, and that's exactly what I'm talking so do about. Do you like now. oil as an investment then? <laughs> that's that's a real not yet. I guess is the right for, way for me to say this. But but he, here's the interesting thing. Why why I think it's interesting that you bring this up is I know Mike and I have talked about this before. I remember you and I and Alex talking about this one time. Is that yep. There are few things more inflationary and there are a few things more deflationary than the price of oil. And it's because it's tied to the dollar and it's because as it goes up, everybody needs it, right? And it's also, that's, that's the inflationary part, but it's also deflationary because, because everybody needs it, everybody has reserves of it. And as the price falls, it can be used as less collateral to loan new money into existence. 
right? So, so you get into this thing as the price of oil falls and deflationary pressures take over, there's less collateral off of which to create new money. So again, I, I think oil is an incredible barometer for whether we're gonna have inflation or deflation. And again, but again, it's very important to when you say that, whether you're thinking in dollar terms or whether you're thinking in foreign currency terms. Well, hope, does that make sense? I'm, I'm well, happy no, to explain it again. You're making more of a Jeff Snyder argument about collateral. I, I thought you were going to go the Mike Green way, which is saying if oil prices go up, there's less money to spend on everything else. Therefore, demand goes down overall. I mean, would that be your well, argument, Mike? To, to, I, I would say there's a band, right? Up until like 120, it's just highly inflationary. You get to 150 or 200 and it's incredibly deflationary because there's just no more money left. But I, I don't know how Mike would answer it. No, I mean, that that is, unfortunately, it is one of these wave particle duality sort of things, right? If the price of oil goes up 15, 20%, that obviously is going to affect headline inflation. This is literally the conversations I've been having recently with people where, you know, where they'll say something along the lines of, well, you know, oil could go to $95 a barrel, right? Well, it's like, okay, well, wait a second. Oil's already at $84 a barrel. If it goes to 95, you're talking about something like a 10% increase, a little bit more than a 10% increase in oil. And therefore, you're actually talking about 3.5% of the CPI index rising by 10%. Congratulations, you've just gotten three yeah. and a half basis points on your annual inflation number, right? That's a really big deal when inflation is very stable and those little basis point moves matter a lot. But that's not what we saw in the past two years, right? We saw the price of retail gasoline, what's factored into the CPI, rise by you know triple, right? It went up 200%. Three and a half percent times 200 percent. That's a big number. That was a huge contributor to the inflation that we saw in the period from May of 2020 until June of 2022. Now we're seeing that reverse. But, you know, everyone is very focused on this. Oh, my gosh, energy prices could go up a lot. And they're not paying attention to what's happening to the OER component or to the shelter component of the CPI, which is cresting and beginning to fall very, very rapidly. Right. So. Just mechanically on the CPI story, I think it's much more difficult than people think to get the sort of yeah. high prints that they're they're worried about. Um, doesn't mean it won't happen, but I think it's harder than people think. I think the second component is something that Brent highlighted, which is particularly if I look at places like Saudi Arabia or elsewhere around the world, you know, they absolutely third, you know, Brazil, for example, as well, they regularly use the value of their oil production as sources of credit underwriting, right? So they'll use it as collateral to obtain credit. When the price of oil goes up, that means they can go buy more stuff. When the price of oil goes down, it means they can buy less stuff. And so perversely, it has an offsetting dynamic in, in that way as well, right? The last component- well, not, only, not only, yeah, yeah not only that, not only that, but if you, if, if the price of oil goes up and as a result, you issue more, bonds or you raise more money, whatever, however you do it, and you use the oil as collateral. And then for whatever reason, oil falls or you go into a recession. Yep. Now you've got all that new debt with less collateral, right? I mean, that's how you get a debt collapse. And I'm again, I'm not saying we're going to have a debt collapse, but that's how it can happen. Um, yeah. it, you know, it, it, every, it can happen there or the other way. And this is what this is the last variable component that Brent was referring to is if oil goes to 150 bucks, I'll never forget sitting at Canyon Partners in May of 2008, a brilliant analyst named Josh Donfeld wrote a note internally. He's like, do you guys understand what a tax burden we've just introduced to the US public with oil at 150 bucks a barrel? Right? I, you know, We literally just took away 5% of household budgets in an environment in which we have a 2% savings rate. Right? That means you have to reduce everything else. You just don't have a choice. And that's a big yeah. part of the story that we saw in the first part of 2022, when we absolutely had recessionary conditions, we saw the unemployment numbers start to tick up a little bit. We saw uh, the economy slow down. We saw negative GDP prints two consecutive quarters in a row. We just didn't get to the extent that people would have required for the NBER to call it a recession, but that was caused by households losing that purchasing power. They've reclaimed that over the last year basically and now it's under pressure again and this is going to be an interesting tension right we've got far less excess savings far less capability to absorb a further increase in oil prices 
without slowing economic activity. I, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out exactly either, but unfortunately it does feel like a storm is building in that direction, but it does also suggest like barring another supply disruption, how high can oil prices actually go if the American public can't afford it? The Chinese certainly can't afford it. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I think as you get older, you get on the one hand, as you get older, you get more stubborn. But on as you get older, you also experience more and then you, you're, you're maybe open to more things as well. But I used to be very anti stagflation. I used to think when people would say stagflation, that it was a total cop out. They just weren't they didn't have the guts to say whether they believed in inflation or deflation. But I would have to say that over the last three years, I actually think as my as I've seen stuff happen and I've kind of kind of developed my I don't know thesis on how I think things will play out, I'm much more open to this stagflation idea. And, and because I think we will have um, inflationary pressures, perhaps from lack of you know we're, we're going to two supply chains. It's not as efficient as it used to be. You know we could potentially have military conflicts, supply disruptions, whatever. But then I also think we could have massive deflationary pressures because of the way the system is designed and you know the lack of uh, abundant collateral when you get a short short squeeze or I mean when you get a collateral call right and so you know I, I think we and especially again I, I know I keep saying it depends on where you're sitting I, I especially think this is more true for countries that are not the United States and or or for currencies that are not the United States or the, or the U.S. dollar. So now that you're an old man and you're experienced and you're gutsy, <laughs> let's go and make some gutsy calls here. Like, what do you like? Like, what, rubber meets the road, man. What do you what do you what do you like over here? Well, I don't like a whole lot right now. I am. I will say the one the one thing that I think inflation could perhaps stay a little bit stickier. Even, I'm I'm incredibly sympathetic to Mike's views, and I and I, and I won't even really argue him. I, I know he's right when it comes to the despite housing, being though, despite oh, him being wrong oh, the last are. two years, right? Well, but but. Yes, but the reason I'm sympathetic to it is I know how quickly you can just immediately go into deflationary pressures based on the design of the system. And especially once we get a few prints of like commercial real estate being sold at fire sale prices, you know, and they have to start marketing them to market, you can get this deflationary uh, pressure very quick and the CPI can just disappear. Um, but I kind of like AGs. Um, I bought them earlier in the summer. They had a nice little run up and I sold them. I, I sold them too soon, but I made about 10% and then they went another 10% higher. And now I've been waiting to buy them back. And I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like this winter, so I'm sorry, let's jump back. Last winter was relatively warm globally. You know, Europe didn't need the amount of energy that perhaps they would have if, if it was a colder winter. Um, and for the most part, um, crop growth was good. You know, Putin didn't withhold grain coming out of uh, Ukraine. I'm not sure that this winter will be as favorable to the markets as last winter. And so I think this winter we could have um, not only, I think we have El Nina coming in this winter. La so I think, I think yeah. a lot, sorry, La, La Nina. So my Spanish hasn't improved at all in, in the last few years. Um, but I think that that could impact crops. I think, I, I think Putin will probably play a little bit tougher than he has in the last year or so. So I, I feel like, Wheat, corn, soybeans, I, I feel like things like those, if, if I had to make a bet on anything right now, that's where it would be. And you want to buy the commodities themselves or what by the, the, the makers or the producers I, of the product? I, I would just buy, the, I would just buy the, the futures, the commodities. Okay. Um, the other thing I know that you like is things that are not totally uh, negatively convex in their construction. That would be things like betting against the Hong Kong dollar betting against the Saudi yeah. Riyadh, the pegged yeah. currencies that would break under your dollar milkshake theory. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, essentially, it, it, I guess it, this, is, this is gonna be a very simplified version, uh, but essentially the way that currency pegs work is that when these other countries have excess supply of dollars or when they get dollars, their central bank, takes the dollars and gives the banks, you know, the local currency. And then the central bank uses the, that, those dollars to turn around and buy their own currency on the open market, which keeps their currency roughly in line with the US dollar. It's a way to artificially keep their currency strong. That's a currency peg, very simplified version, but that's a currency peg. Um, 
And as long as they have enough dollars to do that, it's no problem. And as long as dollars continue to flow in, it's no problem. But when the dollars start to dry up, and then, God forbid, they start to flow out, where do the dollars come from to keep those pegs? And that's, that's if we get into a scenario where the dollar rises a lot, um, or we get a credit contraction, or we get some kind of a global credit event, and dollar liquidity dries up, it becomes harder for those countries to maintain those pegs. And countries will never say that they're going, they will never give you a heads up that they're going to like let the peg go. But eventually, as their dollar reserves start to dwindle, they have to make a decision. Do we keep throwing good money after bad and spending it on a, on a currency peg that's eventually going to break anyway? Or do we save our dollars so we can buy things like grain and oil and other much needed commodities? And I think that's where we're going to get to. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but I think we're going to get to a point. And I think we were getting pretty close last year. I mean, again, guys, I don't think people realize how close we were to an absolute disaster, you know, nine months ago. At the end of September last year, equities were at their lowest point in two years. VIX was at its highest point in two years. Dollar was at its highest point in 30 years. And everything was right on the brink, right? And the central bank stepped in. They got it under control. Powell backed off a little bit. And, you know, they saved the day. But um if it gets away from them and the dollar goes a little higher and they can, and countries can no longer get dollars in order to maintain those currency pegs, then they break. And when currency pegs break, typically they don't move five or 10%. Typically they move 20, 30, 40%. Um, and so I think those are types of things that you can bet on with a very small amount of money. If you're wrong, you lose a little bit. And if you're right, you make a killing. So I, I love stuff like that. I'm willing to, to burn, I don't know, a percent, half a percent, one and a half percent, whatever. You, you pick it out what it is. It's like an insurance policy to me. I'm happy to burn that insurance premium um, and because if and when it happens, which I think it will, you know, you more than make up for the the, the previous premiums and you you make a killing in the process. You so think Taiwan or Hong Kong could break 20 percent? What's that? Oh, I, th I, I think Hong Kong, if, if Hong Kong currency peg breaks, I think it moves at least 30, probably 40. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly think you'd see Hong Kong at 15 if it breaks. Uh, I, I know, very possibly. Yeah. That would be a 100% move. <laughs> right. Or, yeah. The, so, so, so a couple of things that I think jump out. One is you highlighted this issue of people don't fully appreciate how dangerous it got last year. I tend to agree with you. I think that's actually a really important component that it was actually getting very hairy. That's part of the message that we got from the behavior out of, out of England and particularly the UK. Um, the second component, though, goes to some questions that we have, which is this idea, will the dollar milkshake theory break if treasury bonds collapse? In other words, if, if yields move significantly higher. And I, actually, I think it's the opposite. I think. Yeah, it, it is the opposite. It, this right. is, this it, is very important. This is very yeah. important to talk about. Do you want to you, you want to know? No, no, no. You're, 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 you're the milkshake okay. man. OK, so. One of the arguments I will often get is that the rest of the world is no longer going to buy our debt. They are no longer going to fund uh, our excesses. And as a result, you know, the dollar and bonds are going to blow up. Okay. I understand and am sympathetic to this idea. However, you, you have to understand that, again, the system, the entire system runs on dollars. You might not like it, but that's the way it is. And, and the U.S. Treasury is the collateral the U.S. dollar and U.S. treasuries are the collateral off which is the entire world runs. And so everybody needs dollars. You might not need them, but every global operator needs dollars. And every global investment committee, you don't get fired for buying treasuries. You go out and you put 20% of your portfolio in gold and it doesn't pay off, you probably get fired. But if you put 20 or 50 or 30, whatever number in treasuries, you don't get fired because you need those to operate. So it's important to understand how the rules of the game, so to speak. The other thing is, is if the do, if if Treasury bond prices continue to fall, as they have for the last what eighteen months, yep, the yield goes higher. To your point earlier, these uh, these corporations are sitting on dollars, earning five percent, right for doing for for taking almost no risk. That makes the U.S. dollar more attractive, not less attractive. 
as interest rates rise, the dollar becomes more attractive on a global basis. It doesn't become less attractive on a global basis. And, you know, that, and that, that's, why, that's what exactly what you saw last year. The reason the dollar went higher last year is the Fed not only signaled that they were going to raise rates, but they did raise rates significantly. And when they started to say we're going to slow down our rate hikes and we are getting closer to the point where we will no longer hike rates, the dollar rolled over and has been coming down because markets trade on expectations. As the market expects rates to fall, the dollar has been coming down. If, as the questioner asks, treasury prices collapse and yields go higher, that turbocharges the dollar. That pushes the dollar through the 115. Again, you know, we talked about how close we came you know, last fall to kind of this, this global crisis. If treasury prices were, would have continued to fall and yields went to 5%, 6%, 7%, that pushes the dollar to 120, 125, 130, whatever the number is. And that's where you really get the global margin call on the dollar because now everybody wants the dollar. So the, I, I think some people think that I'm an Uber bond bull because that is you know, the dollar milkshake. That, that, I'm actually indifferent to bonds. If we get in a massively deflationary event where everybody runs into treasuries, I think they would run to dollars as well. If we continue to have inflationary pressures and yields keep rising as a result, People go into dollars because they get paid more to hold them. It's in the middle ground where the dollar doesn't do well. And that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, yields have come back. Um, the dollar has pulled back. As yields go back up, I think the dollar would go higher. So um, treasury prices collapsing would actually contribute to the dollar milkshake, just for clarity. And in, in that scenario, it would make gold less attractive because you get paid more to hold beyond currency, whereas you don't get paid to hold gold. One thing that I think it would do, and this is, I, unfortunately, I think this is actually part of what we might be seeing right now, is if you enter into a situation where, you know, you're not going to get fired for buying treasury bills, right? But you might get fired yeah. for buying 30-year bonds, as we saw for yes. Silicon Valley Bank. Yes. Right? And so that I think is actually the kind of the bigger story that is underway right now is as interest rate volatility, particularly at the long end, remains high as the supply is beginning to climb, is this underlying dynamic that we have uncertainty rising at the back end of the curve, right? And the penalty associated with going further out in term premium, this is what Bill Ackman is referring to. And I don't actually agree with him, but I, I think it's important to understand, he's saying, look, it's going to be harder and harder for people to hold that long bond um, relative to the issuance that is likely to come. Um, I do think it's also, yeah. also really important, like I'm watching um, the total bond market indices, and they're headed right back down to last October's lows, right? I mean, this is this is a little scary to watch in a lot of ways, yep. right? Um, yep. So, you know, whether that ends up being an element of a bottom or not, we, we can't possibly know. But, you know, we're, we're in a really interesting situation where, like late 2021, we're seeing a lot of instability. The, you know, support levels for interest rates are starting to struggle. Um, we haven't yet taken out those new highs. But if that happens, to me, that feels like a combination risk off event. And exactly as you're describing, and as we saw today, a dollar strengthening story as compared to a dollar weakening story. And so then we're turning around and we're talking about emerging markets, right? Remember what it means when the dollar rises. If the dollar rises, it means it's harder for emerging markets to get their hands on them to pay off the obligations that they've entered into. It means that the crops that they sell, the products that they sell, the labor that they offer to the developed world falls in value relative to other sources. Yes, they can kind of increase the output. They might find themselves at a relative advantage over a longer period of time. But during that crisis period, that's just ugly, right? I mean, that just gets really bad. Yeah. It's like any number of unprofitable technology companies trying to refinance themselves, as we're seeing with WeWork or with other companies whose tickers I'm not talking about, but whose names you can mention, like <laughs> this is getting hard hard and tricky for people to, fi to find money to just throw at problems. Brent, do you so I think yeah. that's actually a, probably a pretty good place to start to wrap it up. Uh, um, 
Brent, you know, when we, when we talk about the dollar, I want to share one last chart that, you know, we, we have highlighted. And this is one that I think is actually pretty important, which is the only reason why I want to make sure that we cover it, is this issue of which dollar are we talking about? Are we talking about the DXY, which is basically euro, or are we talking about an Asian currency, for example? And somebody actually just piped in, Brian, you just piped in with a question about the Bank of Japan JGB yen situation. Why do you think Europe is doing so much better or the U.S. is doing so much better than what we're seeing coming out of Asia in particular? What do, what do you see going on there? Well, so it, it, I'm sorry if you could, I don't know why my computer keeps beeping. So if, if, if you guys can hear that, I apologize. I'm not sure what's no, going on there. No, we can. That's good. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so I actually think that this chart is very interesting. I, I will answer, before I go into the Asia thing, when, when I talk about the dollar, I just talk, when I typically talk about the dollar, I mean versus other currencies. People often say, well, yeah, but it's not rising versus real things. It's only rising versus other currencies. And it, it, to me, it's like, you know, if I'm talking about Michael Jordan, I'm talking about basketball players. You know, I don't compare Michael Jordan to a racehorse. Yeah, I, I compare him to, to, to other basketball players. And, and that's, that's how I think of the dollar. Um, and so... In general, I think the I think I've made it clear. I, I think the dollar rises versus versus its currency peers. Now, with this chart, um, I actually think that the yen is the key to everything right now. Yep. I mean, I, I know other than the dollar, I think the yen is the key to everything. And here, here's the reason why: is I think that that the that the Bank of Japan has gotten themselves into such a corner that it, regardless of which way they go it has the potential to be globally destabilizing. Now, I, I wanna highlight the word potentially. I don't know whether it will happen or not, but all I know is the table is set in such a way that it has the potential to be massively destabilizing. And this is what I mean. So for years, they have done yield curve control in order to keep rates in Japan very low. Now with inflationary pressures coming up, they have had to potentially start loosening the, the band with, within which they have allowed the JGB, the Japanese government bond, to trade. Um, the problem with doing that is if they, if they allow the, the, the process by which they would try to save the bond market will kill the currency. So as they've done that over the last couple of years, as Mike highlighted, the currency has lost 50% of its value over 20 years, right? It's fallen from 100 to 150 or, or whatever the number is. Um, if they start to raise the, the, the band within which the, the, the JGB can trade, that has the potential to strengthen the currency. So they can save the currency by kind of letting the bond float a little bit more. The problem is, is if interest rates rise in Japan, then the JGB prices fall, right? Now, think about what happened. Why did, our, why did the U.S. banks get into trouble this year? They got into trouble because... Over the last 10 years, they bought very low yielding treasuries. And as interest rates rose, those bond prices fell and the bank's balance sheets got upside down. But what the US banks did not have on their balance sheets was negative yielding bonds. But you know what Japanese banks and pension funds and insurance companies have on their balance sheets? They have negative yielding JGBs. So interest rates in Japan don't have to rise very much in order for those bond prices to fall a lot, and as a result, upset all those balance sheets. And so, you know, the, the Bank of Japan has to be very careful. Which one do they save, the currency or the bond market? Ultimately, I think that they will save the bond market because that's how governments get funded. And if the bond market blows up, the whole economy blows up. Okay, so what's, what is the, what's the consequences of that? The consequences of keeping the bond market safe but letting the currency continue to fall is that as the yen falls, it puts more pressure on the yuan. And the reason that's important is because Japan is a very big regional competitor for China. And China is already um, dealing with deflationary pressures from their real estate market. So as the yuan falls, uh, or I'm sorry, as the yen falls versus the yuan, that puts even more deflationary pressure on China. And it makes their goods even less competitive uh, than they are versus Japan. And so it, 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 it contributes to the an increased possibility of the yuan having to do a deval or the Hong Kong dollar doing a deval. And that would be very upsetting. So, if, so my point is, is if, if, the, if the yen continues to fall, it has the potential to be destabilizing. But if the yen strengthens a lot and interest rates rise in Japan and all of these 
yen carry trades that have been deployed over the last 20 years. I guess I should explain that. Because interest rates have been so low in Japan for so long, many actors will borrow yen because it doesn't cost them anything to borrow it. And then they go invest it abroad, whether they buy bonds or real estate or stocks or whatever it is. And you know, if they even make 1%, they can lever it up and they're golden because their cost is zero. Well, as interest rates start to rise, those carry trades start to get pulled back in, right? And if that, if, so what happens when those carry trades unwind? When carry trades unwind, those assets that the yen was in get sold, right? And as those assets get sold, that has the potential to take liquidity away from those markets, whether it's emerging markets or developed markets. And it has puts downward pressure on asset prices and it puts upward pressure on the yen. So that could be destabilizing. So to me, whether the yen rises or the yen falls, it has the potential to be very destabilizing. That was a long yeah. answer. I apologize. No, no, no. It was, it, was, it was a long answer, but I think it was a great one. I think it speaks to the characteristic. I, by the way, actually share your fear about the Japanese yen. Um, I would also toss on the Chinese yuan, et cetera. I think that there's a very, very real risk within Asia in particular that it begins to fail as the global exporter, right? We're actually seeing, despite yeah. the yen having fallen from 75 to 150 rounding, over the past, you know, since 2011 Fukushima, right? We're actually looking at a situation in which their underlying current account surplus is actually turning increasingly negative. Their trade relationship with the rest of the world because of the loss of the terms of trade for things like electronics, et cetera, relative to the price of oil, which has been relatively stable, certainly in flat panel TV terms or automotive terms, you know, and the competition that's emerging from places like China that's increasingly moving into Japan's backyard on things like automobiles, you know, there's a very real risk that some of these long-standing relationships break. And what you're highlighting is this issue of, you know, what happens when collateral disappears from the system. That's when credit crises begin to occur. When you suddenly discover the AAA credit is no longer leverageable at 30 to one, it's only leverageable at three to one. Yeah. That dramatically reduces things. All right, well, we have taken the entire audience's time rambling about a milkshake and dollar and everything else. And I think like Brent, we're all, you know, we're all struggling with this new world that we inhabit because we deeply understand that there are a lot of challenges in the United States that we're certainly not bringing great policy choices to bear on them. And yet on days when we see things like the bond market sell off, that dollar is strengthening, right? And it's creating conditions under which I think we're all a little nervous that we're going to wake up 12 months from now and find it much harder to get these dollars than people think it is today. So I think that's, you know, that to me is the overwhelming message that comes out of the milkshake theory and the underlying dynamics that we're in. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eric, who's going to lead us out and give us indications for the next one. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Fascinating conversation. For those watching, if you'd like to follow more of Brent's commentaries, check him out on Twitter at, at Santiago AU Fund and subscribe to Milkshakes, Markets, and Madness across other major content distribution channels. Tune in next month for special guest, former OECD economist William White. Until then, have a great night, everyone.